The Apostle Paul talks extensively, Romans 5, about our justification through faith. He says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Pay attention as we sing the chorus of Complete in Thee. We will be singing these words in Romans 5. Let's sing. I told you we would be eventually getting into the book of Ephesians, and we will, but I wanted to sort of by continuation after our family conference last week, which I, which I know last Sunday morning was a particular blessing to you, and if you were, um, if you were to be with us Saturday, I, I know that you enjoyed that as well. We feasted on the Word, but um, I wanted to, sort of by way of continuation, just with the, the, the church calendar and the Easter calendar and everything, just take a few more Sundays to study some church matters. And we didn't really talk about um, the ordinances when we talked about church back when we studied the doctrine of the church over the past few weeks, which really needs to be done because they're not just practices of the church, they're primary practices of the church. Uh, in fact, you can't really have a biblical church without a church that practices the ordinances. So Lord's table and baptism. And so um, knowing we had baptisms come up, I, I wanted to dedicate the entirety of a service to the concept of baptism and what it is and why we do it and why it's important. And so that's what we'll be doing this morning. And then we have Easter, obviously, next week. Then we'll have a, a guest speaker the following week. And then... Um, we will we'll begin the book of Ephesians. But this morning, I want to dedicate our time to this beautiful image that we just saw for us and this beautiful theological reality that we just saw evidence for us in the practice of the ordinance of baptism. And as I was thinking and praying about this morning, I, 
I wanted to make sure there were, there were certain things you understood. And one of the things I want to make sure that you understand is that this is not just, as I said, this is not just something that a, ch- a church does traditionally or for, for any other reason than that it is expressly biblical. And uh, I think one of the things that we do is we can appreciate some of the things that churches do for the sentiment of it rather than the theology of it. So, for example, this week, I try to not use sports illustrations. Okay, I try. Do you know why? Because it immediately isolates most of your audience. All right? But, so I'm going I'm to try to be very specific with my sports illustration. I, as you know, enjoy playing golf. Okay? So I enjoy playing golf. And this week in the golf world is Masters Week. Now, if you don't know what that means, it's like the Super Bowl of golf. Okay? And I grew up in Georgia, and they play it in Georgia, and it's a beautiful golf course, and you, you, turn, on the, you turn on the tournament to watch it, and they have, you know, they've... I don't know if they have birds next to microphones, but you hear the beautiful birds, and there's all these iconic holes with beautiful flowers on them, and so it's Master's Week this week, and I have a Master's tradition. I have a Master's tradition. I move my day off to Thursday, and I drive and I get a chicken biscuit. Do you know why? Because I'm from the South, and that's what they eat at the Master's. And then I go play golf. That's my ma- I wear green. That's my master's tradition. You say, why do you do that? Because I want to, okay? <laughs> and it's my tradition, and I have to. I have to. I might die otherwise. <laughs> I do it because there's a certain sense of sentimentality. You know, this is not the first time I've done this. I enjoy it, and so now it's like it's my thing, and I do it because I, I like it and because there's this a sentiment to it. And I want to make sure when we do baptism, when we have baptisms and when we do Lord's table, what you're appreciating about the ordinance is not the sentiment of it. Because sure, it's wonderful to have your family here and, and see this beautiful image. And, and, and it's a very important event in the life of a believer to get baptized. It's, it's hugely important. It's, it's, it's one of the most important things you can do as a believer in Jesus Christ. There's, it's really hard to explain how important that it is. And we get caught in kind of the emotional sentiment of it. Same with Lord's table. That maybe we can come and we do it once a month. We'll be doing it for Easter. And, and, and we can kind of get caught in the, the beautiful imagery of it, and it just starts to be kind of this sentimental thing that Christians do, and we get maybe emotionally caught in the moment, and then we're actually focused on the tradition and not the theology, or the tradition and not the truth. And so this morning, I want to make sure that we are celebrating it for the right reason, and the, the reason we celebrate it is for its truth. And so that's why you're in Romans chapter 6. There are a number of ways we could have gone with this, but I think that this passage truly illustrates for us, truly explains for us, and teaches for us what baptism is and and why it is so important. So we're in Romans chapter 6. We are actually going to start reading in chapter 5, verse 20. And then we're going to read through chapter 6 down to verse 5. And then, uh, and then 6, 1 through 5 is going to be a primary text. But I want to make sure you get the, the specific context. There's a much broader context, but I want to make sure you get the specific one. So starting in chapter 5, verse 20. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, increased grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace might also reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
We were buried, therefore, with him in baptism into his death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God, the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death, in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. This morning, I want to show you from this passage that baptism is an image of God's gracious work to include believers in the gospel work of Jesus. Baptism is an image of God's gracious work to include believers in the gospel work of Jesus. I'll explain to you what I mean by that as we go along. Let's pray and we'll begin to work through Romans 6, 1 to 5 together. Father, I'm so thankful for all who are with us this morning. I'm thankful for this passage and I'm thankful for what it means. Thankful for its truth. And Father, it's, it's a passage that's all about the gospel. And so would your people today just cherish the gospel? And what you teach us from this text, would your people just be again overwhelmed by your kindness, by your grace? And if there are those with us this morning who are trusting something other than Jesus Christ alone for salvation, would you convict them? Would you draw them? Would you change them? Would you save them? Rescue them by the grace of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that as it was illustrated this morning, your people would, as I've already mentioned, your people would rejoice in the reality that as Christ died, was buried, and was raised, so we died, were buried, and were raised to walk in newness of life. And this morning, if some are with us who are still dead in their trespasses and sins, would you give them new life by your Spirit? Regenerate their soul, I ask, through Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, I mentioned to you that there is a broader general context or setting in which this passage uh, is located. And so I'm just going to do my best to, to, to catch you up on that. Romans... Uh, as, as is typical of Paul's writing, is, is very linear. So he's got, he's got some main ideas, and he is, he's, he's kind of working through them very logically, and everything kind of builds for Paul. And so what we're doing is we're really kind of jumping right in the middle of the argument that Paul is making, the, the logic that Paul is teaching. And so I want to make sure we, we jump, we, as we are jumping in, we're, we're not missing what's, what's going on. And so we'll do our best, best to kind of catch you up on that. But as I mentioned, the immediate specific context really begins where we started reading in verse, uh, verse 20. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And so what Paul is doing is he is explaining the gospel uh, through a number of means. And, and, and one of the ways that he explains the gospel beginning in chapter 5 or starting in chapter 5 is, is to elevate one who was insufficient, and this is Adam, and point out one who is sufficient, and this is Jesus Christ. So one who is insufficient, Adam, and one who is sufficient, Jesus Christ. So the broader context is really Jesus conquering of death, namely the death that Adam brought into the world by sin. And the means by which this death is conquered, or Adam is used synonymously because it was, they go together, Adam's sin was conquered is the gospel. And there are various uh, uh, pr presentations or pictures of the gospel even in chapter 5. If you look in chapter 5, verse 1, there's the picture of justification. Therefore, since we have been justified by 
faith, this idea of justification is more is, is, is a courtroom term. One who should be sentenced to death because of the guiltiness of their sin is given innocence on the basis of Jesus Christ's innocence, and they are declared free from the penalty of their sin. They are declared innocent. This is justification. In verses 6 and 7, we have the idea that Christ has made peace between man and God. Verse 6, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. You say, well, maybe someone's really good. Would you die for a really good person? Maybe. Possibly. But, but what about a bad person? Verse 6, God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we're not even talking about someone who was good. We're talking about people who are bad. And Christ brings them to peace with God by His righteousness. Look with me at verse 8. But God shows His love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we've now been justified, there's that picture again, justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved from His wrath. So Christ saves us from the wrath of God. How? For if we were enemies, we, would be, we were reconciled to God. We were brought to peace with God. Two opposing parties, God and the sinner, are brought together by the blood of Jesus Christ, and Christ makes peace. So, the context continues with the gospel's conquering of sin. And then Paul will turn to the origin of sin. Verse 12, therefore just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. So death spread to all men because all have sin. So where did sin come from? Well, it came from Adam. And everyone born of natural birth afterwards bears the sin of Adam. You say, what does that mean? That's really complex. It's not that it's genetic. I mean, that's not what we're going into, but... But, but the idea is that we all bear sin through our human representative, the first man, Adam. And because of sin, we all die. Why, I did a funeral uh, Friday, why does death exist? Because sin does. But, Whereas Adam brought sin and ruin, Jesus brings something else. Verse 15, but the free gift is not like the trespass. What is a free gift? It is an expression of grace. We'll get there in just a moment. The free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. So the conquering of Adam's sin is an expression of God's grace in giving to us the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 17, For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the man, Jesus Christ. It is now obvious that Paul's focus is grace. God, namely, God's grace to provide a provision to give a resolution to the sin and death that Adam brought. You say, well, why is that important to baptism? Because it is actually this context of grace that Paul moves into the concept of baptism. So that was my introduction. Yippee, right? So the first thing I want to point out to you is the foundation of baptism. The foundation of baptism. Did all of that work to work into the idea of God's grace in providing Jesus Christ. So that is why I say our context actually begins in verse 20. Now the law came to increase the trespass. Now that makes, more, that makes sense. 
as you give more law, there's more of a possibility for you to break. It's just basic logic. If I'm talking to my child and I give her four things to obey, or I give my son three things to obey, you say, well, that's not fair. Why does your son only get three? Because he's two and my daughter's four, all right? If I give my daughter four things to obey and my son three things to obey, they might do okay. If I give my daughter ten things to obey and my son nine things to obey, there's more likely that they're going to sin. It's basic math. You get my point. That's the point that the text is making. As the law increased, so does sin, because there's more that we're accountable to. Now that should feel like a crushing weight. Because now you have to do more, and now you have to be better. Now there's a higher standard that you have to reach, right? Yes. That's true. So apart from the rest of this passage, it is a crushing weight. But, verse 20, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So now there's a higher standard, but now there's more grace. And listen, the concept that Paul is working to, to, towards is not just the idea of quantity of grace, but quality of grace. That the quality of God's grace is more powerful than the effects of sin. So it is not just a quantity idea. Even though it is, actually the word that Paul uses has the idea of mega in it. In other words, grace mega abounded. Super abounded. So there is an idea of quantity, but the specific context of what needs to be more powerful than sin to overcome its effects is grace. So that, verse 21, as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life. So where does the eternal life and righteousness come from? Grace. So the foundation of baptism is the grace of God. When we baptize a believer, we are gathering around to see that God is really gracious. That no one should be up there. No one should be under the water. We should all die in our sin. As Jesus says, you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am He that is the Son of God. So baptism, remember we said we're not, we're, we're make, making sure we're not just appreciating it for the sentiment, we're appreciating it for the truth. The foundational element of the truth of baptism is that God is gracious towards sinners. Because Paul's about to launch into the image of baptism. Now, I should say, Paul is not actually commanding baptism in the passage. He's explaining it. He's using baptism as an image within the argument that he is making. Do you want, do you, I want to be careful how I say this, but I think it needs to be said. Jesus commands baptism. The church pictures baptism. In other words, when you read the book of Acts, people are getting baptized a lot. The apostles, in their letters to the church, say almost nothing. They give almost no instruction that you should be baptized. In other words, when you get to the epistles written to the church, probably not going to find the command to be baptized. You say, well, I don't need to then. Do you know why you're not going to find instruction on it? Do you know why you're not going to find commands on it when you get to instruction to the church? Because it was assumed. They didn't need commanded to do it. Because they had it figured out. 
that when you joined a church, when you came to faith in Christ, and you made yourself a part of a local body, you'd get baptized. It didn't need to be said. There was no category in the New Testament following the book of Acts for an unbaptized believer. No category for it. Okay. Which is why Paul's using this as an illustration is so effective. Because to the because to the people of Rome, he says, your baptism, they, they would have gone, oh, okay. Because now he's speaking in terms that they understand. Because now he's talking about something that they've done. So, as lovingly as I can say this, there is no New Testament category for an unbaptized believer. Post the instruction of Jesus Christ, and following the perfect example laid out in the book of Acts, the apostles assumed it. It was just a part of the church. It was like attending. It's just what new believers did. They got baptized. Okay, that being said, what shall we say then? So first of all, the foundation of baptism is grace. I need to move faster. The foundation of baptism is grace. Secondly, there's a potential objection or a flawed objection. So the foundation of baptism is grace, and then Paul is going to point out something that you shouldn't think about grace. And you know this passage, okay? Or I'm at least, I'm a, you probably do. So that sin reigned to death, grace might also reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? You say, what is he saying? He is responding to the idea that since Jesus can just forgive you, and since God's grace is unlimited, and you'll never get to the bottom of it, there could be this potential devil's advocate argument, well, then you can just keep doing what you want, and then fall back on the grace of Jesus Christ for forgiveness, right? How many of you have ever said, I'll do this, and then ask for forgiveness afterwards, or at least in your mind? I mean, because we would never say that, because that sounds really ungodly, but we would think it. That's the human objection that he's getting to. Don't take advantage of God's grace. But his, his response here is not actually devotional, it is logical, and I want you to see that. By no means, that was, that was fancy New Testament terminology for saying, absolutely not, you crazy people. Why would you even think this? Okay? Now, his, as I said, his response is not devotional, it's logical. Because he says, look with me, verse, verse 2, chapter 6. How can we who died to sin still live in it? What he is not saying is, if you loved God so much, you wouldn't fall back into sin. Now, that, and there's a part of that. But what he's saying is logical. You died to sin. That's way far gone. So, there's no logical reason that you should. You're dead to sin. I want you to see this, because I think we can, I think we can present this like what Paul is saying is, if you loved Jesus more, if you loved God more, and you really appreciated God's grace, you wouldn't sin. What Paul is, and that's true, but the specific point that Paul is making is, you shouldn't sin because you died to it. It's foreign to you now, or should be. So it's a logical response to this objection that if we can just take advantage of God's grace, then we can just do what we want. Paul says, no, because you died to sin. All things have become new. Now to really understand this dying to sin, we have to understand what he's going to continue to say. So the foundation of baptism is grace. Secondly, this flawed objection that we can just take advantage of God's grace, but this is not possible, it doesn't make sense, because we died to sin. Sin should be a thing of the past. Sin was a part of the man that died. or The, the part of us that died. We're, we're crucified with Christ, nevertheless we live. Verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized 
into Christ, were baptized into his death. This is what Paul means. When Jesus died, you died. If you believed in Jesus Christ. For those of you who believed in Jesus Christ, when Jesus died, you died to sin. So, first of all, the foundation of baptism is grace. Secondly, there's this flawed objection. Uh, thirdly, let's look together at the fundamentals of baptism. What does it fundamentally mean? What does it fundamentally mean? First of all, we were baptized into Christ Jesus. Verse 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized were baptized into Christ Jesus? This is the idea of union with Jesus Christ. We were brought to oneness with the Son of God. Now, if you haven't been with us, if you're just kind of joining us today, if you haven't visited with us, we just spent two and a half years in the Gospel of John, and then we spent three and a half months in the upper room. So you, you're missing out on some of this background. But we talked a lot about union to Christ in the upper room. When Jesus, remember what Jesus says when he's with his disciples in the upper room discourse? And he says that, that upon faith, you would be in me and I would be in you. This is what he's referring to. That upon belief and faith in Jesus Christ, we are brought to union with him. We are in him and he is in us. You say, how does that work? Do you remember what I said then? I don't know. This is one of the mysteries of the gospel. This is one of those things that we can do our best to dig into the theology, but at the end of the day, we have to take it at face value that upon belief and faith in Jesus Christ, we are brought to oneness with Him. And this partially explains that. Because those of us who profess faith and belief in Jesus Christ, what does it say? We've been baptized into Christ Jesus, brought to oneness with Him, and we were baptized into His death. So when Jesus died, you died to sin. Because we're brought to oneness with Him. So when He died... We died to sin. So we were immersed into Christ. We were immersed into his death with him. And we were immersed into the grave with him. This is the imagery that Paul is tapping into. The image of baptism that you just saw all the way down and all the way up. You say, why do we do that? First of all, we baptize by immersion because, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best to say this very carefully, but to be as clear as I can, I don't know how we got other methods. I mean, I do, it's history, we can actually trace when those other methods began. I don't know how they come up with them, though, whether it was convenience or whatever. But the word immerse literally means, or the word baptism literally means to be immersed, Consumed by something. Put all the way under, put all the way back up. I mean, it, it literally means to be all the way under. So that's one of the reasons that we do it. But also, I think we lose the terminology if we baptize any other way. Because what Paul is saying is, just like when Jesus went into the grave because he died, so did your old man. So did your sin. Because you died to sin. So as Jesus was laid in the grave, so you were baptized into his death with him, you were too, spiritually. So how can we who died to sin still live in it? We're choosing to stay in the tomb, and Jesus isn't there. Because... Verse 4, we were buried with him, therefore, in baptism. This is the image. We were buried in the likeness of his death. In order that, just as Christ was 
raised from the dead. By the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So I will just make sure you get the full image that Jesus, that Paul is teaching here. And I want to make sure you get it because we just did it and I want you to see it in your mind's eye. So we've placed faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, following after the course of our sin, following after ourself, pleasing ourselves, doing what our flesh wants, doing what uh, our, our pride motivates us, doing what our selfish motivates us to do. Maybe you're saved from alcoholism. Maybe you're saved from some sort of addiction. Maybe you're saved from a life of immorality. You know what God saved you from. And God sends his son because he's gracious, because that's where all this starts, because God's gracious. To live a perfect, sinless life so that he would fulfill the righteous requirement of the law, because you can't and I can't. But would not only fulfill the righteous requirement of the law, but but would have a power to undo the effects of sin. So he would fulfill the righteous requirements of the law and he would undo the effects of sin because he had a pure and righteous payment through the shedding of his blood and because as the Scriptures say, he died according to the Scriptures. So he experiences the effect of sin by dying but he overcomes the power of sin by being raised by the glory of the Father, which we'll talk about next week. And as he's placed in that tomb, a dead body, those who have placed faith in Christ alone die with him. And as God, by His powerful glory, raises Him from the dead, so God, by His powerful glory and grace, raises believers in Jesus Christ from spiritual, physical, and eternal death. This is what you lose when you sprinkle or pour. Because we just saw what it looks like. What it looks like. To be immersed by the grace of Jesus, consumed by the grace of Jesus Christ. We put people under the water because we have been consumed and overtaken, not by wrath that we deserve, but but consumed and overtaken by grace, God's unmerited favor. And the people of God swim freely and fully in an ocean of grace too deep to fathom, and too wide to cross. Believers in Jesus alone will never reach the borders of God's saving grace. Because we've died to sin and been raised with Him by the glory of the Father. But note with me the function of baptism. It's actually very specific. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that. Here's the purpose clause. Here's why we were buried specifically. Just as Christ raised from the dead of the glory of the Father, we might too walk in newness of life. The gospel. God's grace in redeeming us from sin does not just function to save us, it functions to change us. Baptism is an image that we are now fundamentally different. Why? Because we are alive with and in Christ. 
So that means every time I'm selfish, every time I'm lustful, every time I'm covetous, every time you say that word, you think that thing, every time you're angry at so-and-so or whatever, what we're doing is acting like we're dead. Because how can we who die to sin still live in it? So baptism is an image of what's taking place in the gospel and is an image that we are now to be different because we are different. The difference between life and death. And then finally, I want you to see the fullness, the fullness of baptism. Verse 5, for if we've been united with him in a death like his, and we have, we've died to sin because he died for sin. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Now, this is the spiritual resurrection that we're talking about, but the full resurrection of Christ is not fully realized. You say, why? Because death still exists. I told you I just did a funeral. We've done lots of funerals this year. You know, you know that. We've been very affected in our congregation by the effect of sin, namely death. So Christ has conquered the effects of sin. He has r- raised from the dead. This gospel is true. It is assured, but it's not fully realized. Do you know why? Because people still die. We still feel that effect every day. But one day, one day, as we are brought out of the water in baptism, so our souls will fly to Jesus in their fullest resurrection. So the risen Christ will return to a world broken and battered by sin and He will make it new. And He will conquer sin once and for all. And in that day, death will not even be a bad memory of this life. It will be like something that we never could have imagined. It will not enter our mind. It will not enter a reality because Jesus Christ once and for all has conquered death. And the future realization of that will be the people of God living fully and freely apart from the effects of sin, bringing praise and joy and pleasure and experiencing satisfaction that Christ alone provides because He alone saves. So baptism is an image. We don't believe people get saved when they get under the water. It's an image of what has taken place when one comes to faith in Christ, of God's gracious because He is full of grace, work to include believers in the gospel work of Jesus Christ. You say, what do you mean by include? I mean that when Jesus was in a tomb for three days, after bearing my sin, or what, what, what Paul says, in Himself, and yours. I mean that as he, Jesus' dead body, was there for three days, so my sin and crushing weight and guilt lied with him. And upon God raising him from the dead, as oxygen fills his lungs and he breathes again, the Son of God, so spiritual life is granted to those who believe to walk again new. Not tainted by death, not tainted by sin.
So the question really is, why do we not see this more? You know what I would love? Just speaking as your pastor, some of you your younger brother in the faith, some of you your older brother in the faith. You know what I would love? I'd love to have to keep water in that tank every single week. I would love that. So that every time we see this, you think of Romans 6. Every time that spout goes on, it begins to fill up, whether we remember to turn the heater on or not. (laughs) And we did this week. You watch what takes place, and you think, I should still be in the tomb. My soul should be decaying in the grave. And I should stand before the Son, recognizing I have no right to enter His home. But as we were united in a death like His, so we will be united in a resurrection like His.